Out of all the pots I've ever made in my life, mugs, by far, are the object I've made the most of, be it the thousands I've made for my own practice or the endless amount I made during my apprenticeship with Lisa Hammond at Maisil Pottery. For the majority of that time, they were made with stoneware clay, which is the red-toned clay you see me commonly use on this channel. It's red due to the iron content it contains, and it also has some tooth and bite to it. It contains grog, which makes the clay slightly rough and perhaps a little bit more easy to use, especially in comparison to this clay, which is porcelain. And even after all those years of practice throwing thousands of stoneware mugs, it really did feel like a challenge transitioning to this material, as this perfectly smooth white porcelain is much more susceptible to cracking, warping, the handles splitting off, and all manner of other defects. The grog which the other clay contains is essentially a granular mixture that's added to it. It can be made from numerous things, but usually it's pre-fired ceramic that's ground up to a fine powder and then added back to the clay. And it does a variety of things, such as adding strength to the clay, decreasing the amount it shrinks, and it makes the probability that cracks form in the base or around handle joins less likely. And so, all of that's to say that porcelain doesn't have any of those redeeming qualities, which makes it a clay body that's far more susceptible to breaking during the creation process. But back to the video on hand. The first thing I've done when making this batch of porcelain mugs is throw in the approximate shape that's larger than my normal stoneware mugs by about 6%. I do this because porcelain shrinks much more than stoneware does. The red clay I use shrinks about 12% from this stage to finally fired whereas the shrinkage rate of porcelain can be between 18 to even 20%, which means that when I'm using porcelain, not only do I need to use slightly more clay, but I also need to increase my throwing dimensions by about 6% universally. That way the porcelain pieces are the same size once fired as my stoneware pots. So once the initial mug has been thrown and the throwing gauge has been set to the correct dimensions, I can set to work. When I'm making my usual stoneware mugs, I can pluck them off individually from the wheel without the use of these throwing bats, which is the round slice of MDF you see below this lump of clay. As the porcelain is more susceptible to warping once thrown and wired off, I simply lift away the wooden platform and carry the mug along with it, whereas with the stoneware I can quite literally just clasp my hands around the pot and lift it away carefully. Ultimately this means I can store a lot more mugs on any one wearboard which makes the whole process a bit more efficient in regards to space management. So whilst I can place 26 stoneware mugs onto a wearboard, which can then be stored away until leather hard, whereas with this porcelain, I can only store about 10 pieces per wearboard. In reality, and if I was in a dire need of space, I would just upgrade my bat system to one that's a lot more efficient. Space management might sound like a trivial topic, but as any production potter will know, the space you have available to you is sort of your largest bottleneck, and it's incredible, after a day of throwing, just how much space you can take up with boards and boards of freshly thrown pieces. Once the clay has been centred and opened up, I use a cupped hand to scoop up some slippy water and douse it over the walls so that it's lubricated and so my fingers can move up smoothly, like so. My aim here is to pinch the clay around the base where it's thicker, and between two points of pressure, I move it upwards until the rim of the pot comes to rest just by the side of the rubber pointer you can see extending in from the right. This is my target. It's my point in space in which I aim for as I'm pulling up the walls. And when repetition throwing it helps tremendously as it means I'm not constantly having to check the size of the pot with a ruler. Instead I simply throw it once, which is what you saw me do at the beginning. And then I carefully adjust the pointer so the tip rests just beside the rim of the pot. And thereafter, all I have to do is throw the pots so their rims meet that spot. And they'll be more or less identical, although their height and diameter aren't the only factors which go into making a pot look the same as the others. The angle and the finish of the wall make a huge difference too, as does the strength of the rim. And by this, I mean that the thickness of the rim from pot to pot has to remain the same. They all come to a fine point on a beveled edge that meets the outside of the wall. As opposed to making them with a variety of different rims, such as one with a razor sharp lip, another with a chunky flat edge, or one with just a rounded top. Even if all your pots are thrown to the correct height and width, but the rims are all over the place, the pieces simply won't look identical. Whereas if all the rims are finished with the same beveled edge, then they'll really match. As often it's the edges of pots that really convey the most information. They're what you look at from above. 
that what you place your lips around, and if they're all very different from one another, you'll be able to feel these differences when using them. So after all the excess water has been removed from inside the mug, the walls scraped clean and the rim finished, it's time to remove the pot from the wheel. I begin by scraping away as much excess slip as I can from the MDF, as they'll degrade quickly if left wet. I then lift up the rubber pointer so it isn't in the way, and then slide a taut twisted wire beneath the vessel. This separates it from the wood below, and it'll make it easier to lift away further down the line. I then pry the bat away off from the leather hard pad of porcelain beneath and set it aside with the others. And this process did take some getting used to. It might not look like it, but porcelain feels and throws so differently as compared to stoneware. Simply throwing it, you can feel how quickly it loses its strength as the soft white clay becomes saturated with water. I recently switched back to the high iron stoneware body that I've been using for years now, and it felt so easy to move around in comparison. It did exactly what I wanted, but what's sacrificed in usability with the stoneware is lost in its final appearance. It's relatively dull, a stony brown grey sort of colour as compared to the beautifully smooth translucent porcelain. And now all of these have been thrown, they'll be set out overnight so they can dry to leather hard, which is the condition you can see them in now. Much of the moisture has left them and I can easily pick them up and move them around without worrying about deforming the shape. This step is all about refining the form and removing some of that excess weight place the mug onto a solid porcelain chuck. I keep it leather hard so it sticks ever so slightly to the pot that's put on top of it. And then onto the bottom of the pot, I place a spinner, which I apply considerable downward pressure through. And all this helps to keep the pot firmly in place as I work. If you've been watching me for a while now, you'll know that I like to trim. I've always liked pots that are exceedingly delicate and light, beyond what's possible from just throwing. And you'll see that at the end of the video when I shine a light through the walls of these pots and begin by carving away about two to three millimeters of porcelain from the outside, keeping the form straight mostly, although it does taper in ever so slightly at the rim. I hold the trimming tool very firmly with my right hand with my index finger really pushing into the hilt of the blade so that it gouges in with enough pressure and is also kept steady. I spin the wheel quickly so the marks left on the pot are consistent and as I trim, not only am I keeping my right hand steady, but I tuck my elbow into my torso and lean my upper body weight onto it, all in order to add stability to my movements. Compared to throwing, I've always found trimming to be a much more mechanical process. The throwing itself is fluid and quick. The clay moves and flows with your fingers and grows upward as you pinch it, whereas trimming is the opposite of that, at least my style is anyway. You'll find that there are potters who trim loosely who move the tool in such a way that more dramatic marks are left across the surface of the pot, or they'll barely trim whatsoever, leaving the pot covered with indentations made by hands and finger. And ultimately, this is what I love about handmade ceramics. If you give a hundred potters the same lump of clay and the same tools, every single one of the pots made by them will end up looking a little bit different due to the shape of their hands and fingers, how they hold the tools, how they move them. There's really such a wealth of variety, and whilst I of course have a particular style of making work, I relish in the way other potters choose to do it. And at home I don't use the pots I've made, instead I use the pots made by my friends and the potters whom I aspire to, as every time I use one of their pots or wrap my fingers around the handle of their mug, there is some kind of connection, a moment of intimacy and an appreciation for the work they make. Once the base has been shaped, I burnish the clay smooth and then stamp it with my little maker's mark, which I carved myself from a tiny block of porcelain. It's pushed into the base, and this is my identifying mark, like a signature on a painting. That's one piece trimmed, nine more to go. And whilst the bases are pristine and clean at this point, they will either be scratched ever so slightly, or tiny bits of clay will embed themselves back into the finished bottom during the handling process. So after they've been attached and pulled, these will go back onto the wheel, just so the bottoms can be given a once over and corrected if needs be. And they can also be polished too, once fired. 
The next step is the handling process. I begin with a large block of clay, which I soak in water and then pull down gradually. My aim here is to create a length of clay that's even and the same consistency throughout. And the longer I can get it, the better. This length will be separated into many individual handle blanks. In no way are they the finished final thing. Instead, each blank will be scored and slipped to a mug, carefully joined all the way around, and then pulled again into a much more defined and delicate shape. An extruder would do this job for you too, or you could just roll out a long coil and flatten it slightly, as the cross section I want is slightly oval in shape. But I like this method of pulling. It's quick and efficient. It's the way I was taught, and it's the way it's been done for hundreds of years here in Britain. And I like the idea of continuing tradition and of showing these methods online like this. This long length is then taken over to the table edge or the edge of a board. I lay it out and use my thumb to snip it off against the edge. This creates a flat portion which I'll then easily be able to tap out to create a flare and then attach to the mug. And at this point it doesn't really matter if they touch one another or if there are fingerprints on them as each one will be attached to a mug and pulled again. And that's a process that begins immediately after this. I don't let these dry out whatsoever before using them. And in the summer, I'll even wrap them up in plastic and keep them sprayed with water so they don't dry out too much. So when the clay is soft, not only are they much easier to attach to the mugs, but they also pull far more easily too into their final shapes. I use a serrated kidney to score an area, roughening it up, and then I dab over some slip onto that spot. This softens the wall of the pot ever so slightly, and it means the porcelain handle, when pushed against it, will adhere with a lot more strength. I then place some fingers on the inside of the cup, and these brace the pressure being exerted from the outside as I push the handle against the mug. Once it's firmly attached and holds itself up, I can move on to the next step, which is blending the join and then pulling it into its final form. When using stoneware clay, Water works just fine for this process, but with porcelain it was nearly impossible. So instead I use porcelain slip, which clings to the length of clay and keeps it lubricated for much longer, as compared to just plain water, which immediately just runs off the handle blank or is quickly absorbed, which degrades the clay and weakens it. Once the handle blank has been firmly joined and blended in all the way around, I can begin to pull it. This is a process where I'm pulling both quite firmly, whilst at the same time I'm being extraordinarily delicate with my movements, as all it takes is one wrong move for the entire length just to tear away in your hand. And that can not only ruin the handle blank, but the pot itself can be damaged too. I work slowly, pulling the blank longer and longer, and then towards the end I use the tip of my thumb to pull in three grooves along the back of the handle. This thins the length out even more but it also creates some areas in which the glazes can pull into, and in terms of ergonomics, it creates a pleasant area in which you can tuck your thumb in when you're holding the mug. Once the handle length has been looped down, I firmly press it into the clay near the base, smearing in the excess either side and onto the base if needs be. I always clean up the bottoms of these a few days later, so if they are a little bit messy after this process, it doesn't really matter. And here's how they look in their freshly pulled state fluid, as if they've grown from the pot and naturally flow back into the mug at the base. And this may be a little bit romantic, but I adore pulled handles for the simple reason that when you use one, you're touching and holding an area that has been crafted solely by the fingers and hands of the potter. They show the making marks and the streaks left by the thumb and fingers as they press and pull the clay, and they more closely reflect the thrown nature of the pots themselves. Now. To stop the joints from cracking, which is notorious with porcelain, as the thrown mug and the pulled handle are different consistencies and dry out at different rates. So to prevent any cracks from forming around the handle joints, I spray them with a lot of water and then tightly wrap them up with plastic and I'll keep them sealed like this for a couple of days. And the idea is, whilst in this environment, the two components, both the handle and the mug, will acclimatise to one another and become the same consistency and it's only after that's happened that I'll dry them out more thoroughly. And even then, I'll allow them to dry out slowly for a couple of days beneath plastic. As it's rushing the drying process, which causes pots to crack. A number of days later, it's time to clean up the base of each mug. I fetch my porcelain chuck, which when it's not in use is wrapped in plastic and kept in an airtight box. 
and due to how tacky it is and its own weight, it doesn't need anything else to help secure it in place on the wheel. And all I do at this point is give each mug a once over, both visually and with my fingertips, and making sure that there are no burrs of clay stuck into the carefully finished base or leftover clay that's been smeared over the beveled edge when making the handle. And then lastly, I go over these surfaces with a very smooth metal kidney to burnish and compress the base one last time. And that's it for these. After this, they'll be biscuit fired, then glazed, and then gas fired. And here's a few examples of how they'll look once finely finished, coated in both new glazes and some of my old ones too. The two green tones are actually my usual crackle glazes, which you see me using primarily on my stoneware clay, and they actually work surprisingly nicely. Although they appear to be a little bit patchy, the glaze feels wonderful. It's very glassy and smooth. This is my white crackle glaze, and on porcelain it does take on a very slight yellow, almost green tinge, which I'm not too fond of, and by the very subtle darkening around the rim, it feels like a glaze that might carbon trap quite a lot. Then there's the eggshell white, which is coated over in only a very thin wash, and you can see just how thin these are when I shine a torch through them. And what's not quite visible in this video is that inside these forms, the white glaze takes on a very, very subtle pink tone in the corners. Next is one of my new black tests. This one has a slight blue tone that comes through, but ultimately I think it worked better on the stoneware clay. It's on this very flat porcelain. It doesn't have too much life. The next glaze is more or less identical to the last. The only difference being that it contains 5% red iron oxide which gives it a slight metallic sheen, and up close it almost feels like bronze. Anyhow, that's all for this week. Thanks so much for watching, especially those who make it all the way through. I know I say that a lot, but it really does help. And quite honestly, I'm still rather surprised by just how quickly my subscriber count is growing. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week.